What we are going to talk about today, um, just kind of give the outline of what I do, which is health physics. It's a lot of bureaucracy, so I'm going to give a quick overview because I don't want to bore you guys first talk out of the gate. Um, what is the linear no threshold model exactly? I feel like that's one of the most important things we could talk about from a health physics perspective and a radiation safety perspective. It's been in our culture since the 1950s and really, you know, from the beginning. And there's a lot of chinks in the armor that we're starting to find. And it's a really exciting time for radiation safety. So health physics, you can replace health physics with radiation protection. That's what we do. The term, we're not really sure where it came from. The first health physicists were really physicists in Fermi's lab uh, trying to create shielding for the first nuclear reactor in Chicago here. The short answer is radiation protection. The long answer is the protection of human beings in the environment from the harmful effects of radiation while permitting their beneficial use. Uh, you can think nuclear medicine, you can think nuclear reactors. Anything where we want to get something good out of it, you need someone standing next to you saying, you know, don't do, be a little safe. Uh, another way to think of it is it's a marriage of physics and biology. Uh, if you're a hard scientist like I was, that made me a little squeamish at first. I didn't like the biology, but if you, once you get into it, you'll understand it's a little more elegant and sophisticated in a way, and it's, uh, it's interesting. You find a lot of interesting things. So the organizations, health physicists deal with bureaucracy. Um, the biggest one is our Health Physics Society. It's a na national organization. Um, there are a couple thousand of us, and we meet every year. Uh, the biggest government agency that we deal with is the NRC. And you would think, okay, we've got our society and our governmental regulations, we're good. Everyone else wants a piece of the pie. So it's not only the NRC, we have the DOE, NCRP, ICRP, ICRU, IAEA, and it goes on. This is just a small smattering of it. Even NASA has its own regulations and I have to deal with that sometimes. Uh, so it's a very interesting, complicated situation. Um, the two that are the biggest ones are really the one big one, the NRC. It was established in 1975 after the Atomic en Energy Commission was broken into two. The NRC and then what would later be merged with another department to become the DOE. Uh, it oversees nuclear energy, nuclear medicine, and essentially everything that isn't nuclear proliferation. And I, I picked out a couple of the regulation codes that if you guys want to go home and take a look at these, this is what we work with. 10 CFR 20 deals with human health regulations in the environment. 10 CR 50 deals with licensing for nuclear reactors. If you're going to start a thorium reactor, this is what you need. And 10 CFR 71 is dealing with the waste, the after effects. Um, th this, the stuff on the left, the NRC is law. The stuff on the right from the NCRP and the ICRP, that is strongly worded suggestions, let's say. It's an international coalition for the ICRP. We have our US version, the NCRP. And the ICRU is a sister version of the ICRP. I, I didn't pick out any of these because they're all very specific. Uh, I actually do some work in space radiation, so I've got, they've got two or three binders on space radiation. Anything you want to find health or nuclide related, you can look there. Radiation biology basics, starting from the beginning because not all of us are on the same page and I want to make sure we are. The most common particles that we encounter in everyday life are the alpha, beta, gamma, the helium nuclei, positrons, electrons, and any photons that are ionizing, so UV, X-rays, and gamma. We also run into neutrons, protons, heavy ions, which are anything above lithium, and fission products. Anything beyond that, like muons, pions, kaons, you won't see unless you, go, unless you leave Earth's atmosphere. So these are the big ones we deal with. However, not all particles are going to be created equal. And the reason for that mostly is something called linear energy transfer, how quickly they lose their energy. Uh, the high LET on the right is an alpha particle. And we all know that alpha particles don't penetrate very far. The reason is because they give up their energy really quick. It's a helium nuclei with two positive, it's a plus two charge. Once it hits something, it's gonna be stopped fairly rapidly by, all, by the electron cloud. So you'll see something on the right where you'll see this energy deposition. On the left side is low LET, something like a gamma ray. It doesn't lose it as fast, so it actually goes through. That's why it can penetrate farther, but it actually does not cause as much damage in a localized place. So if you can imagine this circle being a cell, an alpha particle is actually much worse for a living cell because all the damage is localized there versus a gamma ray, which may hit more cells, but won't cause as much problem. This is a, um, 
I guess a, a picture of some of these tracks. A straight line on the bottom is the alpha. You can see that because it's a straight line, regular deposition. Beta, the curve line is actually a beta particle, an electron, because what it's happening is that it's interacting with the cloud and it's gonna be jumbled through. So it's path through a cell or through any shielding is gonna be a little torturous. So what happens once it gets through the cell? How does it actually damage us? Depending on the penetration and depending on the energy, there are two things that it really does. You can, as far as we know, DNA is what causes biological damage. That seems to make sense, but this is the biology part. We can't say it for sure. What we think happens is single strand breaks and double strand breaks. In a single strand break, only one side of the DNA is lost, the nucleotide is damaged. We, those are generally easily repaired. The double strand break, on the other hand, there are mechanisms to repair it, but it's not as perfect. So the higher the energy, the more likely a double strand break is going to happen. And in fact, in a high fluence of particles, if you have more electrons, even if they're not energetic enough, if you cause enough single strand breaks near each other, they act like a double strand break and they cause the same amount of problems. So the damage, 30% is about what it is that it's directly to the DNA. 70% of the damage is not from a radiation particle hitting the DNA. What it's from is hitting the water in your cell. It separates the water molecule, creates hydroxyl radicals. They go in turn causing, they wreak havoc on the DNA causing one or more single or double strand breaks. So that's just kind of the background of what happens. Now this happens all the time. The single strand breaks, double strand breaks. This is not something that is unique and it doesn't just happen because of radiation. Chemicals do this. We allow, our body has repair mechanisms. So this is happening right now all the time. And even if it breaks and you cause a mutated cell, it repairs it wrong, you're gonna have a mutated cell. Oftentimes it'll enter apoptosis, it'll die. Nothing will happen. It's only a series of events that have to happen to create a cancerous tumor growth. Before we move on, that's the bi biological background. We need to talk about the units of radiation because there's some confusion and this is where, if you're speaking to a public, you wanna talk about thorium safety, they need to, you need to have a good understanding of what it is. Absorbed dose is just the physical energy per mass, how much energy you deposit in a cell. That is joules per kilogram in the SI. Um, RAD is the old unit, only the US uses it and we really try to move away from it, so, the older folks, if you want to keep using it, that's fine, but you know, if you want to stay hip, go SI. Uh, one gray is one joule per kilogram, like I said. But that doesn't tell us, because of the LAT, the energy deposited, every particle, gamma particles can deposit one gray of energy, alpha particles can deposit one gray. Those both cause different amounts of damage to cells, different likelihoods that you're gonna develop cancer. So what we have to do is turn that into something called the equivalent dose. And that's just the dose multiplied by the radiation weighting factor, which is decided by the NRC. Um, for example, alpha particles, you multiply your dose by 20. And gamma rays are one, so 20 gray of gamma ray deposition is equal to one ray of alpha ray deposition. We don't call it grays, we call it sieverts. That's the difference. Um, grays are the physical units, sieverts are more of a probabilistic measurement of how likely you are to cause cancer. Um, that is, equivalent dose is for a whole body effect. If you want to get more complicated, which I have to, when it's non-uniform or it only hits a kidney or your uh, tonsils or something else that is more radiosensitive, we break it up by tissue and we have to weight it that way. Those are still in sieverts. Don't worry about it. it all, sieverts are the probability, but it's good to know that there are three different types that we use. And this, I found a great picture off of Wikipedia, so you, don't, you can just go there and look up uh, effective dose, and this should give you this picture. It's a good thing to go if you wanna go back and work on it. All right, now that we got that there, I want to talk a little bit about linear no threshold. And Stated simply, this is one of the most fundamental underpinnings of our, it's the, mo it's the most fundamental assumption that health physicists make. Uh, it's not, if it's overturned, I would say it's on the scale of Einstein overturning Newton. It's that big of a deal for us. What it says, it's a model that we've used pretty much since the dawn of the nuclear age that says that we assume the long-term biological damage caused by ionizing radiation, in, in essence, cancer. We say cancer risk is directly or linearly proportional to the received dose. 
and there is no threshold below this relationship below which this relationship does not apply. Um, most of our data, if you can imagine, comes from for hot, moderate to high doses, we are very confident about that. That comes from studies of victims of Nagasaki, Hiroshima, Chernobyl, and uh, recently the moderate can come from the workers at Fukushima Daiichi. So we are very confident about the upper half of this. The problem comes when we get to the bottom. And there are a lot of reasons, but we have a very hard time measuring a very low radiation dose. And it's very hard, it's statistically dubious to draw conclusions from this. So what the NRC does is they follow the precautionary principle. They say, we're not sure if it's harmful, so we're going to assume. And that seems like a fair thing to do, it seems like a safe thing to do, but it has a lot of unintended consequences and a lot of fuzzy math. If a dose would kill one in a hundred people, a tenth of that dose would kill one in a thousand people, one hundredth of that dose would kill one in ten thousand, and so on. And you go down to pico sieverts, to, you know, yato sieverts, I can't think of how far down. Essentially, one electron traveling through a cell could cause damage. And that, that is the assumption that, for a long time, we had no reason to disbelieve. Uh, Tubiana, uh, one of the, a doctor in 2009, she wrote a paper that, where she said the relationship between dose and DNA damage in vivo seems linear from one milligray to a hundred gray. I'm not sure how she got a hundred gray, but I trust her. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we peak at five before we start having real problems. But from one milligray upwards, we're pretty sure that it's a linear relationship. The problem is that beyond that, we're not. Uh, life developed in a bath of ionizing radiation and solar ultraviolet radiation, and they created aerobic organisms requiring three things. Defenses against metabolically induced reactive os oxygen species, DNA repair, and elimination of damaged cells. This is the idea that we were born in a sea of radiation, we evolved in a sea of radiation, we should expect that our bodies should have some sort of underlying protection from radiation. Low level, at, at least. And she goes on and says, several sets of data show the efficacy of these defenses to be much higher at low, and hi low than high doses and for fractionated, so separated over a long time, and protracted irradiation than for acute. So low radiation over long periods of time, our bodies actually respond better to that than high radiation. So this is not, this is not a linear relationship, or it seems to be suggesting that, uh, below one milligram. And she goes on to say, and this claim is highly hypothetical, the linear no threshold, and has resulted in medical, economic, and other societal harm. And we can talk about that in a second. Point B is the linear no threshold hypothesis. Point A is the idea that it may actually be more harmful at low doses. C is slightly less, and D is something called hormesis. Um, a lot of people know about this, the idea that we're actually, low bits of radiation are actually beneficial for us. It, you know, it, it kind of jump starts a repair mechanism. Those are the four option, options that we have. And I like to quote a certified health physicist on why we have to know, why it's so hard for us to know. We are bathed in radiation from the moment we're born to the moment we die. We are bathed in it right now. Millions of particles are passing through our body, causing these single strand breaks, double strand breaks. There's no way that we can avoid it. Um, if we leave the Earth, it becomes even worse. And here's a rough breakdown of what it is. Every year, you get about three millisieverts of radiation. In the US, the average is six, because most of that comes from CT scans and nuclear medicine. But we get six millisieverts a year. Below that, we have no statistical certainty we, we can't separate this out from the background radiation. We can't separate this out from the man-made radiation. And one of the paradoxes of LNT is that we don't take into account background radiation. We say one man-made electron traveling through your cell has some risk of cancer and we have to deal with that. But this background radiation, which is the exact same electrons and alpha particles, we're just gonna kind of set to the side because we can't do anything about it. Um, and Health physicists, we know this hypocrisy and we just kind of work with it because it's not our job to define this. But when people talk about the fear of radiation and the, the release from Fukushima, they don't realize how much, how much radiation they get every day. And this is something where if you guys are able to go out and you're talking to someone, 
Fear of radiation ultimately comes down to fear of the unknown. Radiation is the only danger to humans that we have no sense to notice. We can't see, taste, hear, touch, smell it. We can do that with chemicals, we can do that with you know, animals, we can do that with anything else, but radiation, we're told that it hurts us, but we have no way to know this and feel this. And you can read reports after Fukushima Daiichi. One of the negative effects of a linear no threshold is that you release a smaller amount of radiation, Japan decides to evacuate two, three, five miles out. The psychological harm from that far outweighed any possible cancer risk. And that is, that's a real effect. There were suicides after the fact because of the uncertainty and fear of what this was, of how much radiation they're gonna get. You know, people don't understand that they live in a sea of radiation. And so if there's one thing I want to leave with you all and hopefully have you continue and go out to talk to people is that radiation, you should minimize it, but you're never going to eliminate it. It's always there and there are a lot of reasons why we will be, there are a lot of reasons why linear no thresholds should not work. Or it is a, it is an old model that will eventually be out eventually be replaced. Um, I'm gonna pass this on. I'll put these in the YouTube video because I wanna let us move along. There are some things, I'll just leave those here, two things that are underlying the idea of linear no threshold being wrong. One is the monoclonal theory of cancer, the idea that one damaged cell can become a, a invasive tumor, a metastatic solid tumor. There's some evidence that a large, a large portion or perhaps a majority of cancers are actually polyclonal, which would involve more than one piece. And if that's true, then linear no threshold is no longer applicable. If it takes more than one damaged cell, then LNT is wrong. The other thing is called intratumor heterogeneity. Essentially what it means is that when a tumor metastasizes and moves to other parts of your body, it continues to grow in new ways and that the way that it evolves, it involves multiple new damaged cells. Um, metastasized bra breast tissue, for instance, can have up to 10,000 unique combinations. And if there's more than that, then again, LNT is wrong. Um, so we're not there yet. Linear threshold is a possible model of the real world is far from dead. It is still our standard, but the preponderance of new data requires a new look at the underlying assumptions of the model. We have to be willing to go back, test our assumptions, and realize that even if there is some risk from radiation, it, far un it is far below the risk of not using nuclear power, in my opinion. So that is all I have today. I'll let us move on. So thank you. Thank you, Chen. No problem. Not only was that a great talk, but you brought it in.